Hello and welcome to the Start Here podcast for web development. My name is Dane Miller, and we're here to teach you how to build a career in web dev. You can find us online at starthere.fm. So today's episode is going to be broken down into three different segments touching on three different topics. The first topic is project management for web developers. This applies to both working on a team as a project manager, but also it applies to your own projects, both on the side, personal projects, but also as well, if you're running a freelance business, uh, you'll have to be managing those projects as well. The second topic, we're going to actually discuss going freelance. So sort of a segue from that topic into freelancing, we're going to just touch on some of the thoughts and techniques that I used when I first went into freelancing, I went freelancing first before I actually got a job and I think that allowed me to build up some skills and things that I would have otherwise had trouble getting before I got into that job interview. And then lastly, we're going to discuss the whole computer science versus programming conundrum that people have. So if you learn programming via Ruby on Rails or Node.js and JavaScript before you learn computer science, people often feel like they'll run into this issue where they really need to know algorithms or something like that. And then on the other side, on the flip side, people often feel like if they learn computer science first, then they're not actually learning how to write the architecture, how to write the actual programs. They might understand the lower levels, the algorithms and the fundamental paradigms and the programming patterns even, but they perhaps don't know the syntax. They, you know, So there's a dichotomy between these two different camps and, and these two different types of people. Oftentimes you'll run into people that give conflicting advice. A lot of the times people will say, you have to learn programming first. And a lot of the times people say, well, I would go through a computer science class first or even a computer science graduate degree or undergrad degree first. Now we're gonna get into that last and there is a lot of opinions that I have on that, but it's pretty common sense, guys. I mean, you could probably guess my opinions on it. And really, you know, just to sort of spoiler alert my opinions there, it's basically, if you don't go to college, you can still do everything and learn everything that you would without a computer science degree. So that's a sort of a spoiler alert. That's kind of a, a theme that we've had throughout these episodes is my recounting and making sure that you guys remember that you're totally capable of learning everything that you would learn at a computer science class. All right, let's just dive into the first topic here. So we got project management. So when we're talking project management, what we want to make sure we discuss are a couple of different areas. The first area that we want to discuss with regard to project management is the structure of the project itself and the type of project that we're talking about. When you're thinking about project management, it's really important to, to pick a level in which you're zooming in or out of. So for instance, if you're managing a project that includes the launch of one app across five different platforms and five different development teams with five different applications. And you know what I mean? That type of project is much bigger. And so you have to zoom out to a higher level in the way that you manage it and the way that you handle issues. Whereas if you're just working on your own website or your own portfolio, that's a project. And if you're working on your own side, side business, that's a project. If you're working on getting your first client or paying customer or even your first uh, consulting gig or freelance gig, those are projects as well. So really we wanna analyze what type of project we've got going on. Now, after we've analyzed the project and figured out is it a huge project or is it kind of small, make sure you use relative uh, scale here. So don't overestimate the size of your project. If you're just building your first website, one trick that I, that I really think can help everybody is that do not blow out of proportion a project. If you're building your first website, keep in mind the concept that in five years you're going to be managing 20 people on two different teams building three different highly complicated web applications. So the point here is that we don't want to over dramatize or over emphasize a specifically small project, especially at the beginning phases, because that can lead to a lot of negative things that we've already talked about. Like it can lead to a lack of motivation because it seems too daunting. It can lead to overwhelm, right? And a lot of, we, we discussed in a previous episode, people freeze up when they get overwhelmed. So if you're able to just use relative scale in your thought processes in th in your thought processes you'll be able to understand that 
these small projects that you're doing now are small and that's okay that they're challenging. It's okay that they're small. They don't have to be big, but using relative scale, we, we no longer need to over dramatize or over emphasize these projects. We can just plow through them, right guys? Like that's the mindset that you want to have for these small projects as you're building up and building up towards your ultimate sort of bigger career projects. You want to keep plowing forward as hard as you can and as fast as you can. So as, as long as you're continuing plowing forward and moving as fast as you can aggressively moving forward and constantly using that scale and then also modulating what height or what altitude that you're looking at the project from. If you're doing all three of those things, you're gonna have a much better time with this because those three are sort of the fundamental keys to really being able to manage your own projects effectively. Okay, so the next thing that we wanna talk about is how once you understand the size of the project once you've used relative scale to analyze other projects that you might potentially do in the future what is next now you know you might see the project you might have it mapped out in your mind let's just use a realistic example let's say you're it's um building your first web application using node.js uh, let's say it's a personal project a personal portfolio project. So if you re-listen to episode one of the Ruby on Rails podcast, or even this podcast, the Start Your Web Development podcast, you'll know we talk about a lot padding your resume with personal projects. And actually in the Ruby on Rails episode one, I, I recommend a specific type of web app just for you guys to have something concrete that you can do. It was a book lending application, so a library. So you can uh, log into a website that allows you to rent a book, post a book to be rented, and, and so on and so forth. And, and we gave a bunch of business rules that like were fictitious, but allowed you guys to have some realistic things to work for, to work towards. So since we did that, that was very successful and a lot of you guys like that. So let's continue that sort of realistic example. So let's say you're building this first portfolio site. It's this library site and you kind of are overwhelmed. Maybe you're just like starting it and you see it in your mind, but you don't know what to do or how to approach the project at all. So, what I would do is, first of all, let's start with the fundamentals of like, how do we think about the project? And then let's sort of go into the practical ways that I would approach this project. And again, this is a simple, this using relative scale, we can see this is a simple project. It's just a small web application. Yeah, it's challenging for one person to build this, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that bad. So really we're gonna keep moving forward and keep that mindset on, okay, we can do this, we got this because in five years I'll be working on 10 times more complicated stuff with 10 times more people doing 10 times, having 10 times more impact in the world. So you better get this. If you don't get this, you can't make it to the next level, right? So you're gonna get this and we're gonna start walking you through it. Okay, so the first steps, fundamentals, thinking fundamentals for projects. Again, we already mentioned a couple, right? We mentioned the altitude. So the altitude at which you view the project is important. Again, we, we said this is a small project, so we can zoom super small, we can zoom in super low. We don't have to be thinking about 10 different projects and how does this apply to the business that like might be being bought by another business. We don't have to think that broadly. Here, we're gonna zoom in a little bit and we're just gonna look at the project from a 20,000, 10,000 foot view. What it is, is it's a, web application that allows users to log in and sign up. What they can do is they can rent a book so they can have a certain type of an account. They can be an admin and post books or they can be a student, let's just say, and the student type accounts can rent books. They can't buy a book, but they can rent. And once they rent a book, if there's no more quantity of that book available, it becomes unavailable for the rest of the students. So pretty simple project, pretty basic business requirements. Now we have the fundamentals, so we know what this is. What we're gonna do next is we're gonna write out what we just said. So the first step is to open up a document and really just spec out at a high level, what is this project? What are we doing? What are we trying to get? What are we trying to achieve? And it just kind of dump everything you can, but try to keep it in one page. We call this the executive summary. Um, it's there is an ex there the executive summary has an almost actual definition kind of like a Harvard Business School definition we're just using that term loosely here it's an executive summary of the project so you got that perfect so the next thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna look at that summary 
and you're gonna analyze what sort of technologies you wanna to use to build this project. So being in the technical world and us talking about project management, one of the most important things that plays into project management is what kind of technology are you going to use? Because, and people don't think about this, the type, the type of technology that you use should fit the shape of your organization, right? So if you're a startup, it's acceptable to use Rails. If you're a Fortune 500 corporation with thousands of developers, you might frequently see Java being used and .NET being used. And new developers are often confused about why this is. New developers, junior developers, they often say, you know what, I'll go work at that corporation and I'll use Rails. Who cares? Like, why do they care? And the thing is, guys, it's not so much that you can't. A lot of those corporations would let you use whatever you want, but the reason that Java and .NET are proliferated so much throughout these cult companies and corporations is because those technologies and the, and the technologies that are around those languages fit the shape of those organizations. That's about as simple as I can explain it. I'm not a Java developer or a .NET developer, so I can't go into super detail on that, but I can explain it from the Ruby on Rails point of view. So on the Ruby on Rails side, it's acceptable oftentimes to see startups using Ruby on Rails. And that is because the Ruby on Rails language and, or the Ruby language and the Rails framework really suit, suit themselves to startups because you can do things very quickly. The language and the framework both utilize a concept called convention over configuration. So what that means is because they conventionalize certain things that other languages and frameworks wouldn't, it allows you to spin up new applications, spin up new ideas, test things, do MVPs really, really quickly. And because somebody who's really experienced with Rails already knows those conventions and is very familiar with those conventions, we're talking about like a month long development cycle being brought down to a couple days usually. So. The, this type of expediated development is perfect for startups. Now, are you guys sort of seeing what I mean when I say a language and framework and technology has to fit the shape of your organization? This is a concept that is used only at the highest levels of development management that I've seen. I've never heard anybody talking about this at any other levels um, at any other companies. You'll see this talked about at like companies like Square, where they have these massive distributed infrastructures at companies like Airbnb, where they're working on massive problems. These are the kinds of things that you guys need to be thinking about. Whatever the top 1% of web developers are thinking, I want you guys to start thinking about. Okay, so now that we understand that the technology is super important, we have to go ahead and pick one. So let's pick a technology that would adequately fit the size of this project, right? So when we say the size of the organization, we also, obviously mean the size of your projects, the type of projects. Are you working on a distributed project on a project that's just you and nobody else is working on it, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're gonna do is let's just pick randomly Node.js. So we described a website that allows you to rent books and some other things. Let's just pick Node.js randomly. Let's say that there's a requirement that the books be parsed, the book, the available books in the library be parsed from a constantly updated XML feed. So this is, you know, this is a good use of Node.js in some sense. Like we could just put Node.js on a, on a server that is just sort of parsing that, uh, that XML file. And then it can spit the output into S3 in some kind of normalized fashion. And then from S3, we can read it from some sort of API or front end JavaScript client even. We could just, we could have an API that reads from S3 and then we could stick some kind of front end JavaScript client on top of that and then just sort of boom, have access to all that data like magic. Now, or sorry, have access to all those books like magic. So now that you've got a project technology selected, what you wanna do is you wanna look at the date that you want to set the project for and then you wanna do a work back plan and then adjust the date moving forward. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and set a date into the future. So we're gonna set a date that is a deadline for ourselves. So we're gonna say randomly two weeks from now, right? Now you're going to look online at tutorials for types of websites that you're doing. You're going to go on Twitter and maybe ask some people who are experienced developers, how long would a site like this take you to build? So basically what you're doing is KSE. So you're getting knowledge. So you don't you don't know how to set a date correctly, right? Because you've never done this before. 
So what we're doing first is we're gonna go ahead and set a date randomly. So we just have a line in the sand. Then we're going to go online and we're gonna get knowledge. So we're gonna to talk to people, we're gonna look around, read tutorials, analyze how long people are spending on these tutorials. Are they 10 part tutorials or two part, right? So that's a huge difference in how long you can suppose a project like this is gonna take you. So you do that. So now that you have sort of an idea of the rough outline of the steps involved in the project, you can make some kind of educated guess as to how long it'll take you. So you see all these tutorials online. And again, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, go back and listen to Ruby on Rails episode one. One of the huge key points in learning is reading tutorials, guys. So I just told you about this project, this website that we're gonna build. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna read so many tutorials, like so many. And then and we're not even gonna do them. We're just gonna read them over and over and over again. And the point, really listen to that episode if you don't know what I'm talking about, but the point is that we're sort of gaining this context in our brain as to what they're talking about. So later, when we go to work on our book site, we'll just we'll just know, like it'll just be in our brains. Like, oh, I, I gotta install Devise now I, I, because I have to set up user authentication and I know that's what everybody else uses. So perfect, okay, so setting up Devise. So now that you have this idea of, of sort of the, the individual steps required to reach the goal, the outcome of your project, a web development uh, or a website that is functional, what you wanna do is you wanna ask yourself, do I need any design? Do I need a design element to this? So for simplicity's sake, let's say there's no design. So it's just gonna be a black and white site, black and white buttons, but it's gonna be totally functional. So I'm gonna log in, I'm gonna see text that says my name, I'm gonna be able to click on buttons, but it's all gonna be black and white. You're not gonna really have to do any design for this. If you did have to do design, then it would obviously uh, change the type of project it is a little bit because you're, you're going back and forth with somebody else or you're having to learn it. So you're gonna to have to expand that deadline. So feel free to add that to this project. So now that you have all the individual steps and you have the rough outline of how long it might take you, what you wanna do is you wanna readjust that deadline. So now you've identified the pieces and you've educated guessed, you've educationally guessed sort of what those will take you. So now what you're gonna do is you're gonna go ahead and move out that deadline. You're gonna push the deadline out a little bit to whatever the educated guess is. Now you kind of have a great framework in front of you. And what I do is I actually draw out timelines. So I'll say, you know, I'll have two pieces of white paper taped together or a huge white pad. And I'll be like, now and then draw a line and it's like two weeks from now and if that's the if that's the educated guess that I had and then I'll just put like tick marks on the line and I'll be like install device and then go down like a quarter inch install this install this install it like set up this set up that set up this and so on and so forth so utilizing that strategy I'm able to see the whole project and, and sort of make sure that I'm tracking towards the completion of the project in a, in a burn down or some kind of continuous fashion. I, you never want to be like guessing. So you never want to have a project going on and be like, am I achieving the deadline that I said I was? You don't ever want to be guessing guys. So having that sort of white paper, it can just even be one white paper or one small white paper that has that line that says, here are the tick marks of all the different items I need to do. And they could be high level items. And every time you complete one, you just draw a line, like a line bar, and the line bar has to go all the way up to the top right. Starts at the bottom left, has to go up to the top right to complete. And that sounds like a very simple thing, and it is, but guys, I use that for all my goals, and it's it's a total game changer. Actually, on my wall, what I do is I have literally every single goal that I have for every single month, and a line that's like now to the end of the month. And I, I track every single key key performance indicator along that target to reach that goal. Okay guys, so now that you have the project, you have the deadline, you have all this stuff set up, what do you do now? So one of the most important parts of project management that people forget is consistency and follow-up. And when you're not working with other people, what that means for yourself is consistency and checking in. So. What you wanna do is you wanna make sure that you then take consistent action. So this is the thing about projects that I find is different if you're in a job and it's different if you're working with other people, but when you're doing projects alone, guys, I know a lot of you struggle because you're learning web development on your own and you're wondering like, how can I keep going? How can I keep going? And I know we talked about that in the last episode, there was a question on that, but really, the best way that I can say this 
is the most unexciting. And the real answer here, guys, is every single day, be consistent. Just be consistent. You know, I was reading this book by Richard Dawkins, who's a controversial fella, but he has this book that's really good called The Selfish Gene. And in it, he talks about this concept that if we're a slave to desires, it's because it serves an evolutionary purpose for the species, but not for us. So for instance, if we're sitting down to do some work that we know would make us succeed, but we feel procrastination, we feel lack of motivation, we feel desire to go get some food, we feel desire to go step away, to not do it, to go play, like all of those desires that move you away from the thing that would cause you to succeed, it's actually because of an evolutionary thing in your brain. It's totally normal and it's it's hardwired. It's literally hardwired in your brain to feel that way. And it's an evolutionary thing. It's some, I, I'm not an evolutionary scientist, so I'm not exactly sure, but what he said in the book was those desires serve the result of the species, not the result of you. So it doesn't help you achieve your goals, but it definitely helps the species achieve their goals, right? You feeling that dopamine and that sort of serotonin and wanting to go on to new things and new things and new things. So this sort of this sort of new to new to new jumping that people do, this serves an evolutionary purpose for our species. Now, some people are the exact opposite, and they also serve an evolutionary purpose for our species. But what you want to focus on, guys, is you want to focus on not being a slave to your desires. So, you know, right now, it's really difficult for me to record this episode, right? Like, there's all kinds of things going on in my life that it's like, well, I could be focusing on all of those and my my mind wants me to focus on anything but this. But really, because I'm doing this as an exercise, right? So this is an exercise in me telling my brain that it's under my control. I'm not under the control of the desires of the species, even though you and I genetically are. Don't be. Fight it. It's basically akin to going to war with yourself. It sounds extreme, but it's not. You have to go to war with yourself in order to achieve these projects and these goals. So a huge part of project management is doing consistent action every day. And I know I've been harping on this for episode after episode, but it's so key. Consistent action every day, guys. Okay, so you're doing consistent action every day. The last thing that we wanna touch on before we just move on to another topic is checking in. So a lot of people don't check in with themselves. And what that means is, so as an example, uh, David Allen, the founder of Getting Things Done, the whole movement, and he wrote the book Getting Things Done, he is a very dry speaker. So if you, if you <laughs> I would suggest reading the book instead of listening to audiobook. I, I actually recommended the audiobook of that to a friend and he was such a dry speaker, it turned, off, it turned my friend off of the uh, material. So read the book if you've never read it. But in the book, he talks about a concept. He says, the most important thing that if I could just give everybody in the world a pill that would change their life. And really what I think he was talking about when he says change your life, he, he's talking about change your ability to achieve results. And he said the pill would instill the practice of a weekly review. David Allen said if he could give everybody on the planet a pill. So David Allen is somebody that spent 35 years studying productivity. He said if he could give everybody on the planet a pill that would do one thing to change their lives, it would be to instill the habit of a weekly review. So keep that in mind, guys. That is one of the most powerful things that you can do. And that's what checking in means. So we don't just want to check in on this one project. What we wanna do is we wanna utilize the little bits and tidbits that we've learned in this segment and apply it to all of our projects. So yes, you should be checking in on this project, but you should be zooming out, looking at all the projects that you have going on that will lead you to success as a web developer, and you need to be applying a check-in, a weekly check-in. I even do a daily check-in on every single, so you can take this to the extreme. But here's the key. If you take this to the extreme, you get extreme results, right? <laughs> let's not be, let's not get it twisted, guys. If you do things to the extreme, guess what? You get extreme results. I'm not, it's better to do 1% a day. He, as Bruce Lee said, he doesn't fear the man that knows a thousand kicks. He feared this man who did one kick for a thousand days. So it is better to do 1% a day forever. But I'm telling you, if you do things extreme, you get extreme results. It's just the way it is. It's the yin and yang. What we wanna do is we wanna check in on our projects weekly or daily, 
if you want to get extreme. So we want to ask ourselves three things for each of our projects, even the one we've been talking about, but all of our projects, even the ones that apply to web development. Here's the three things. First one we need to ask, where are we at now? So where are we at with this project right now? We need to get current, get this stuff under control, get organized. So if you don't have that executive document, if you don't have that executive summary, if you don't have a task list that has the result at the top and the tasks, the actions that will lead you to that result, get organized, get it under control. Do that, step one. Step two, the second thing is to ask, what can we do to help ourselves get to where we need to be? So what we'll do is in this step, we're just gonna go through all the stuff we've written out previously. We have all these actions. Um, if you remember my white sheet of paper with a line on it that has a bunch of tick marks with different actions, we can go through that. We can just look at it and say, okay, is this still right? Is, it, is this still accurate? Because as you move forward, you're gonna often tweak this, right? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go through and make sure it's all accurate. Then the third thing, this is the most important. Most people don't do this. Most people don't do the first one, but if they do, they most people don't get to the second one. If they do, most people definitely don't get to the third one. The third one is, what are the one or two high leverage activities that I could do that would make the rest of these actions unnecessary, right? Maybe the answer is nothing. Maybe the answer is I need to do all of these actions and that's it. But guys, always train yourself to look at leverage. Always train yourself. Train, train, train your brain. Train your brain to look at leverage, please. It is something that I'm so passionate about. If you view everything in your life as how can I apply maximal leverage to this? What is the biggest lever that I can stick in this and pull down? What is the biggest front-loaded work that I could possibly do uh, to leverage my ability to know stuff without needing to work as much later? So. All of these sort of leverage principles you want to read about, become a master at, and become a really solid thinker at because you want to be able to utilize these throughout your life. All right, guys, that pretty much wraps up the check-in. It's just really important that you remember to, to do those check-ins on all your projects and all of your weekly goals and all of your monthly goals. And again, if you want to get extreme and do it every day, then that will help you as well. Okay, guys, now we're going to move on to the second segment. The second segment today, we're going to talk about going freelance. This is for anybody that's a new web developer or a current web developer or somebody that's not yet a web developer at all. This topic covers all of those different types of people because what we're gonna talk about here is how you can utilize the skills that you have or the things that you're just learning to get your first client and to get into your foot in the door as a freelancer. So the first thing that I would keep in mind when trying to become a freelancer is the hardest part is finding the clients. So the hardest part isn't learning the skills, the hardest part isn't managing projects, the hardest part isn't getting paid or doing billing or collections, the hardest part isn't doing phone calls with clients, the hardest part is literally just finding the clients. So you have to position yourself such that you have a portfolio, you have a personal website, you have an about page on that website, you have a contact form, you have a contact page, you have a portfolio of some sort, and if you don't have any paid projects to put in your portfolio, you're gonna do those personal projects that we've already discussed, and you're gonna use those to go in your portfolio. Now, if you already are a web developer at another company, that's great. You can put their stuff in your portfolio if you worked on it. Now, what you're gonna do is you're going to immediately say to yourself, okay, before I need to worry about my brand, like what is my logo gonna be? What is my, how am I gonna do billing? How am I gonna do this and that and the other thing? Before you do any of that, Let's approach this like a lean startup, a lean company. Like what, what is the first thing a lean company would do? Well, they would try to find a market. So they would try to validate that there is a market for this. So what that means is until you guys have a freelance client, I don't want you to think about anything else except finding a freelance client. Now, before there is one prerequisite and you have to pick a client, you have to find a client that has a project that you know that you can do or that you know you can learn how to do, but, within a couple weeks before it's due. So what you wanna do is you wanna to say to yourself, okay, I have skills in Ruby on Rails maybe. I've done 10 Ruby on Rails tutorials and one book website uh, where, they, where they can rent books for a personal project. I have all that on my personal site and my portfolio. I would say that person is immediately available to start building MVPs for clients. So if a client comes to you and they say, hey, I, need, I have a business, it's a dry cleaners, uh, I want to make a website for it so that people can log into my website. They can they can pay with a credit card uh, and it adds points to their account. That's that's it. 
That's all I want. And okay, you could do that. If you're somebody that I just described that did like 10 tutorials and one personal project that was of small to medium complexity and you're an ed self educator, I know for a fact that you can achieve that that goal of building a website like that for a dry cleaner to keep track of bill uh, points billed for credit cards. It will be a little bit challenging, but what isn't? So what you wanna do is now that you've analyzed where you are and you've analyzed the type of projects that you could probably have or do, you wanna to try to find clients. So the hardest part is finding clients. So how are you gonna do this? What are you gonna to do to actually find these clients? First thing that you're gonna do, you're gonna get a Twitter account. Second thing, you're gonna to go to meetups. Third thing, you're gonna make sure that you utilize your Twitter account and provide value and fun things every single day. So just share your life, share a little bit about your life. Get really involved in Twitter. Really follow your favorite people, meet people on Twitter, at reply them, mention them, et cetera, et cetera. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna to go to job postings and forums where people are looking for freelance clients. So there's plenty of forums and job boards where people are looking for um, web developers as a person with an MVP or some kind of idea, right? So the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna go to all those places and you're gonna reply to about 100 of them. Now, this is literally a numbers game. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna wanna apply to as many as you possibly can, 100 or 200 different posts. Now, you're gonna, not, not really 100, I, mean, I would do 50 realistically if i really needed the job i would do 50 and then i would be guaranteed it's just it's a literally a numbers game you can get clients if you just put in the work so you're going to put in that work you're going to reply to 50 job posts stating you know a personalized message for each one saying here's my portfolio here's a link to what i've done here's a link to my production book website right now there's gonna be all these fears that are coming up in your mind. Like, well, I don't have a design for the website. So it's like really ghetto looking. Guys, it's not so important. I would literally just use what you have and try to do this anyway. So I would try to go out there and find those clients even with the projects and portfolio that we already said that you have. So the next thing that you're gonna do is you're gonna to want to wait and wait patiently. So you're gonna wait patiently after you do those job posts for people to start replying. The replies are gonna start trickling in and as they do, you're gonna start realizing and noticing things. You're going to start noticing certain types of projects that are becoming available, certain bigger projects, certain smaller projects, et cetera. So go ahead and pick the smallest project. If it's just a script, that's fine. But what you're gonna do is you're gonna pick the smallest project out of all the people that reply to you. If it's just, hey, God, I need a Ruby script or I need a PHP script that does the following, do that. If it's, hey, I need a personal website built for my daughter, I'll pay you $300, do that. If it's, hey, I need a very small MVP website for my business and that's the smallest project you found, do that. Doesn't matter what it is, just do it, do it, do it. And then do that a couple of times. So after doing this for three times, this is a guaranteed formula. After doing this for three times, you've worked with three different clients, you've done three different projects, small, small projects. You've done three different small projects. And what that means is you're now familiar with starting a project, completing it, working through the middle, billing, and it's not that hard. You'll figure this shit out as you go. I'm not gonna give you little tips on every single aspect of this. I can, if you guys are interested, write me and let me know, but it's pretty simple. I mean, you're, you're, you're basically going to just Google around online. How do I charge my customers for a website, like for my services to build a website. Just Google that, guys. It, uh, you don't need me to tell you. You know the answer to most of the stuff that you could do to change your life and to become a good freelancer, to become a good programmer. You just have to do it, right? So that's why I'm sort of hoping these motivational tips inside of these episodes sort of re-enables your mind and, re and makes you realize that just do it. You already know what you need to do. Just do just start doing it. Just start. You. So here's the thing. If you want to be a freelancer right now, if in your, there's a subset of people listening to this that right now want to be a freelancer. So subset of people, 10% of the listeners of this show, let's say there's 300 people right now listening to the show that say in their head, I just started web development six months ago. I know enough to get a freelance client for a small website. Why don't you have it? Why don't you have it? You already know what you need to do. You know in the back of your head that you have to sell, that you have to go out, make make uh, connections, negotiate things, go out to forums, go out to Twitter, 
meet people, socialize online, socialize in person, find the clients and do it over and over and over and over again. You already know the answer to that. You just want some kind of secret pill or secret formula, like go to this website, like, you know, developersneededjob.com or something. And, and this, you know, it'll be the easiest way to get a client. Guys, that doesn't exist. You could get a freelance client through like hired or some, one of these websites that helps you that's fine, but you gotta be really good to get into those websites where they will sort of shepherd clients to you. You have to be very good, and you're not good enough, probably, listening to this podcast. Secondly, you wanna keep in mind that you just gotta do it. I mean, you just gotta go out to all these different forums. Keep in mind, guys, when I got my first client, first one ever, and then all the way up until I got my fourth one, and then I got my first job, all four of those clients, I sent out probably... Uh, 150 emails to get three of them, right? 150 emails, guys. 150 individually tailored emails to an email address, to a response on a forum, to an inbox, to somebody on a forum who mentioned something about a website he needed to whatever, right? Like one of them I found through like a website called builditwith.me, which was very interesting. <laughs> so... You're gonna go out and you're gonna analyze and scour the web for all these different places that you could put in the work. And then you're gonna put in the work over and over and over again, reach out, reach out, reach out, contact, contact, contact. There's a little saying that I love that goes, the fortune is in the follow-up. And that just goes to show you how important contact is. So you gotta be making contact. If you're, if you're a wannabe web developer, wannabe freelancer, and you're not making contact with, with potential clients, with potential leads, then guess what? You're not going to get there. I'm sorry. You're not going to do it. You're not going to get there. That's not how this works. There's no secret that I'm going to tell you at some point on one of these episodes that's going to make it easier for you. It's the same hardness for all of us. Even for me, if I wanted to go out and get a client right now, it's not easy for me just because I've been doing this for like however many years um, and know a ton of people and have LinkedIn. I could, you know, I probably couldn't find a client by the end of the day if I needed to, but if I put in enough work, I could, right? So the point is, guys, it's not easy ever, even with a good, perfect social circle. It's always a little bit hard. It's always a little bit challenging. You always have to put in that work, but if you do, it's a numbers game. That's the biggest secret. If you do, it's a numbers game and you will get a client. Okay, so I think that's enough motivation for freelancing. Um, those were a lot of different random tips and we didn't go into detail into many different specific topics of freelance and we didn't touch on billing or how to, you know, talk to a client over the phone. There's tons of stuff that we could go into here, guys. And there's a lot of phases of the introduction, like the first phone call, the first Skype call. Those are places where people mess up a lot. And actually, before we stop here, I'll just give you a couple tips on that. I see a lot of people that get the first client and then they get on the phone and then the client runs away. So here's what you gotta do, guys. You have to be a little bit charismatic. You have to practice speaking a little bit. You have to put a little bit of effort into it for the love of God. I mean, just because you're a programmer, a lot of you listening to this do put effort into it. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the people that are just want to be programmers and don't wanna to talk to other humans. I see that a lot. Oh, I'm a programmer. I just want to talk to the machine. I don't need to talk to humans. They don't get me. They don't get me. That whole vibe, that's fine. That might be true. They might not get you. I might not get you. But guess what? You have to make it a personal practice for you to be gettable, for you to be relatable. You have to make it a personal practice to be charismatic. Because if you don't, you're not going to go anywhere. It's just a matter of fact. If you do not become a little bit charismatic and a little bit of somebody that people like, you're not gonna get invited to the bigger teams, to the bigger jobs, to the higher salaries with more clients, better clients, better companies, better places with more impact on the world. How are you gonna do that? You have to be somebody that people like. And it, this doesn't mean that you have to change your character or change who you are or become some kind of fake person. Just literally be a nice human being and care about other people. When they're talking, listen. Don't be thinking about what you're gonna say. It's just very simple. When you get on the phone, be very extroverted. Even if you're a little introverted, talk a little bit louder than you normally would, but not too loud. You know, be sort of an outgoing type of person strategically, even if you're not. 
So that's how you have to be. You have to modulate your personality a little bit so that you can have the best success as you navigate through the human relationships that make up life. Okay, on to segment three of the web development podcast, episode 25. Here we go. This topic is a big one, but we're not going to, we're already pretty far into this episode, so we're not going to spend a ton of time covering this, but it is a big topic and I want to touch on it. So it's called computer science versus programming. (laughs) So here's the thing, guys. Everybody wonders, should I learn programming? Meaning, should I learn Ruby on Rails first or should I go get a career or degree? Sorry. So people ask, should I learn Ruby on Rails first or should I learn computer science first? Should I learn algorithms first or should I learn programming patterns first? Should I learn merge sort first or should I learn quick sort first? Should I learn JavaScript before I learn before I read the discrete mathematics textbook. So these are questions that people get so hung up on. The And these are somewhat important questions. It's understandable why they wonder about this because here's the thing. Most people in your industry, if you're listening to this, you're probably a self-educator because that's sort of the audience that we have. But a lot of your peers came out of big universities. So it's totally normal for you to wonder Am I doing the right thing? I'm self-educating, but man, am I doing the right thing? I don't even know because all my friends that are at these web development jobs, they came out of these big universities and they got these big degrees in computer science. They're fucking scientists. And I'm just sitting here at night trying to learn web development. So this is a very normal fear. And this is a very normal sort of juxtaposition that you will make in your brain. Um, And it leads to people asking this question. Now, asking the question is fine, but the problem is it leads to a lot of people being completely obsessed with this question. That is unacceptable. So as a self-educator, the one rule is it's completely unacceptable to ever be obsessed with any one topic because a self-educator is only a self-educator until he stops learning. The day that you stop learning is the same day that that you obsess over the last thing that you just learned. So... What that means is people often will mix this up and they will major in the minors and they'll minor in the majors. So uh, that's just another way to put this that I've heard Jim Rohn say that I really love. So for instance, this is a minor thing. Should I learn this or that? Should I do this or that? Really the answer is just do anything. That's kind of the ultimate fundamental answer. Just do anything and go now, start now, start learning web development now, go take that course now. It doesn't matter what the answer is, just do it now. And that puts you in the top 99% of people because a lot of them are stuck in this analysis paralysis place because of questions like this. And again, it's totally normal. So I don't want you to think that what you're thinking is negative or in any way not normal. What we need to do is we need to totally accept and kind of like forgive ourselves of all of that and just say, you know what? that's not me. That's not my life decisions. I'm not at that university right now. And I know that this Dane guy on this podcast, he did it. He's a self-educated web developer working at this huge company or whatever, doing whatever. So I know I can do it. And I've, my other friend is doing it. So that's not me. I didn't come out of the university, but I'm here at night. Here I am at home learning. I'm going to make the best and do the best that I can. I'm going to do a little bit tonight and a little bit tomorrow and a little bit forever. And by the end of a month, the end of the year, I'll be a fucking badass, right? So that's what you're going to do. And that's what you have to say to yourself because you you don't have the same life as the person that came out of that university. They had some kind of opportunities and that is true. That is kind of nice. It is nice to go to university and learn computer science. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie about that. A lot of people that work at boot camps and code schools and stuff, they'll tell you things like university is bad. Computer science doesn't help people become better programmers. And there is some truth to that, guys. There's a little bit of truth to every single angle of this topic. This is a big topic, and there's a lot of arguments in almost every angle looking inward. And there's a little bit of truth to everyone, right? So there's a little bit of truth to the concept that computer science school really is awesome, and it helps. There's a little bit of truth to the fact that it doesn't and that coding boot camps are better. There's a little bit of truth to that. You don't need any of those, and you can do it all yourself right now. Like, There's a little bit of truth to all of this, and that's why, again, the fundamental best answer is just to go and do a little bit now. But let's break down this question a little bit, and let me just outline for you what you will learn at computer science school and what you can do as a self-educator to learn it anyway. 
So the first thing that you will learn at computer science school is kind of the fundamentals. And I'm gonna go through this quick. Computer science undergraduate degree has tons of classes. I'm not gonna go through every class. Again, I, I didn't even go to a computer science school. I'm currently actually attending uh, a computer science curriculum just sort of for fun because it's so fun, right? So w the first thing that they'll teach you is kind of like the fundamentals. How does the internet work? How do machines work? How, what is a Turing test? What is all of these fundamentals? What is the abstract meaning of computer science? What is science? How do we think critically? How do we do scientific method? All of that. And that's great education. I really hope everybody learns the scientific method and really gets it under their belt. So the second thing that they'll teach you is discrete math. And I'm just gonna go through these in order of my, my thinking of importance. So the second thing is discrete math. So you can buy a discrete math textbook on Amazon. It's called discrete math. Buy it and learn it. It's super hard, super weird. And it, there's like set theory in there. It's super complicated. Just do it and learn it consistently 1% a day. It'll make you a better programmer. Second thing is algorithms. This is a huge topic of uh, computer science. F theoretical computer science is a lot, there's a lot of focus on algorithm development and algorithm speed and efficiency, right? So what I would recommend here is I would pick up a computer science book called Algorithms, the sixth edition. It's on Amazon. If you just look up that, it'll be the first result. Pick up that book and go through it. Now, you, you have these two books. These two, hard, these two hardcover textbooks that I just gave you are by far, by far, recommended to me by three different computer science PhDs to be the only two textbooks that they still have after computer science school. So let me say that again. Three different computer science PhDs, meaning they did over four years of computer science, the only two textbooks that they still have and that they recommend, three individual people on three individual occasions recommended these two textbooks that I just gave you. So guys, go get those textbooks. They're a little bit expensive because they're textbooks. They might be like 20 bucks or 30 bucks, but get them, put them on your shelf. If they're too complicated for you now, you'll get to them later. Now, what you wanna do now that you have those textbooks is you want to open yourself up to some knowledge from a higher level education source. So because you can't attend a computer science school because you're a self-educator, that doesn't mean you can't watch their videos. So go to Yale.com, go to or Yale.edu, go to Harvard's computer science, uh, computer open computer science courses, go to all these different places like Coursera, Udemy, Udacity, and find the courses about computer science from these leading universities. They put their videos online. They even put the assignments online. Yale even puts the exercises and like the answers online. So you could do the entire class. You could take the entire computer science curriculum in some of these universities without even going and spending any money, a single dime, right guys? So take advantage, take advantage of this, take advantage of this. So what you'll do is actually, you know, for me speaking personally, before I actually started this computer science curriculum for fun at Harvard, one thing that I was doing was I was just going online exactly like I said to you guys to Yale, edu and all these different places and I was finding great videos. There's great videos. I learned about um, the spectrum of computability where you have P, so P problems and then you have NP problems and then you have uh, some that overlap. So some algorithms are can be done in polynomial time and some in non-polynomial time and some are like what? So there's all these like things that I didn't understand and I had no idea. <laughs> if you're listening to this and you're like, wait, what is non-polynomial time? It's fun to learn about and it's really trippy and it's really fun. So you guys are gonna love it. I'm telling you, you're really gonna enjoy it. And if you're a programmer or a developer, you're gonna enjoy, or you're an engineer and you know you're an engineer type, you're really gonna enjoy it even more. If you're more of a front-end developer, designer type, you might not enjoy that, and that's fine. You don't have to do this. But make sure that you're going online and researching and reading about those types of things. Now, because you're new, it's most important that you focus on practical skills. So it's most important that you read tutorials, right? But I would spend five minutes every hour that you're doing a tutorial reading a higher education theory item. So here's the way that I would fix everybody's issue with computer science school. So everybody at all these code schools, they say computer science school, they say computer science school is not as effective because they don't teach you programming. Instead, they teach you the theory over and over and over. It's like 90% theory, 10% programming. That's true, right? It might be 80-20, 80% theory, 20% programming. 
Now, a code school or a boot camp is like 100% programming, right? Now, my recommendation to you as a self-educator that can go at your own pace at home, if you're not at a boot camp, is to do every hour of practical implementation, do five minutes of theory. So get those textbooks, go online, find a video, uh, find a blog post about com some computer science topic. It doesn't have to be in order. You don't even have to know what you're fucking reading. Just pick something and read it for five minutes every hour that you're doing something. It can be five minutes every two hours, five minutes every three hours. You get the gist. It's basically a one to nine ratio. So for every nine times, you do something one time, so it equals to 10. So what you wanna do is just pick something reasonable for you. It could be 10 minutes every three hours. Like who, ca who cares what it is specifically? The point is you're following some kind of ratio that will allow you to balance the theory that you have with the practical skills that you have. And utilizing this balance, utilizing the balance of barely any theory, but some, and a lot of practical skills, I believe you will achieve a perfect Pareto efficiency. So Pareto's, Pareto's really famous for his Pareto principle, right? That's the 80-20 rule. Now, I think Pareto said something even better that I liked more, which is the Pareto efficiency. So a Pareto inefficiency is basically a lose-lose. So a, a robber, he, he robs a store, so they lose, and then he probably will die or end up in prison, so he loses. But a Pareto efficiency is a win-win. So for you here, you're doing a Pareto efficiency because you're winning because you're getting the practical skills, right? And you're doing it at the correct balance. You're doing 90% practical. But you're getting another win, so a Pareto efficiency, a win-win, because you're learning a little bit of theoretical skills. And you're doing that in the correct balance. So it's a super efficient way to learn, right? Now, you have to assume that I'm giving you the correct balance. If my balance is off and I'm telling you a false fact that, that you know, perhaps the balance should be 80% theory, 10, 20% practical. If that's true and I'm saying it's the opposite, it wouldn't be a Pareto efficiency, right? But from my point of view as somebody that's been doing this for over seven years, nonstop, learning on my own, never been to school until recently to start a computer science curriculum, like this is the way to do it. This is, this is the best way. If I could go back in time, I would do it this way. It would be hard. It would be hard as hell. And I would struggle every single time I read theory, I would struggle, but I would do it anyway if I knew how important it is at this exact moment in time that I know it right now. Now, a lot of you guys aren't gonna be able to take my advice for stuff like this. So there's a, large po there's a large segment of the population that has to learn on their own. This is actually a known thing, scientists have done studies on it, that some people literally can take in information from a book and not apply it to their life. So they can, because they, they say, they claim that they need to learn on their own. So I'll be telling you this, I'll be telling you different things like, Guys, learn this theory, do 10% theory to every 90% that you do practical. I'll be saying things like that and 10% of you might do it. 5% of you might do that or less. The, mo the majority of you are probably going to say, that sounds right, but you're not gonna do it and you're gonna fail to do it and you're gonna have to learn on your own and you're gonna be sitting at this exact point in time five years from now looking back saying, man, I wish I would have learned a little bit more theory because at that one job, I wouldn't have been able to do better. Maybe I wouldn't have gotten fired at that one job where I didn't know that algorithm thing that I should have. So keep in mind, guys, that when I'm telling you this stuff, it's literally from my own experience and exactly what I would say to myself. You guys are in the exact same position that I was. The, the exact same. There's, there's no difference. In fact, I was even in a worse position. When I first got my first freelance client, I was 20 days from being homeless. So I was literally 20 days from being homeless, meaning not financially 20 days. I was that too, but like literally 20 days from the day that I got my first client, I was actually homeless and like I had to figure that out. So I'm certain that you guys are in a better position in your web dev career and self-education to learn this stuff and do better than me than I was. And I expect that you take part and take advantage of this advice. So seriously, guys, take advantage of this advice. Be coachable. Be somebody that is coachable. This will separate you from the 10% of the world that succeeds dramatically above the 90. Be coachable. Be able to learn from other people. It's probably hurting your ego that I'm even saying this. You're probably like offended, like, oh, well, why is he saying that? I'm, I'm coachable. I, I, don't, I don't need, you know, I don't need to learn on my own. I can learn from somebody else. That's fine if that's true, but a lot of you, it's not. A lot of you don't want to learn from others and it's not even conscious, it's subconscious, it's deep down. 
on the conscious, you're like, yeah, I do want to learn from others, but you're not changing your actions. If you're not changing your actions, you're not doing it. Like we said last week, proof is in the pudding, talk is cheap. Do it, guys. So change your actions. Do this 10% theory for every 90% that you do that's practical. Do some kind of ratio like that. It's big help. All right, guys, that will wrap us up this week and start here web development. Thank you for joining us. I hope you had a good episode. Again, this is episode 25, and I just wanted to give you guys a quick shout out. I've been getting a lot of good feedback from you guys on email. If you're on our email list at starthere.fm or dane.io, there's email lists all over the place on the top of those sites. You can go and sign up for those. We're sending motivational emails that you guys are loving. Uh, we're sending, we're doing courses through our emails that you guys are really going to love. We're doing a web development accelerator course that's all done through email. So if you're really interested in accelerating faster than what I'm talking about here, even faster than what I'm talking about, guys, then go to starthere.fm or to dane.io and sign up at the top bar. You'll see a yellow bar on both of those sites. Go ahead and enter your email there. Uh, and you can join and take part in this accelerator. What we're gonna talk about are things like how to learn faster, how to apply mental frameworks to learning programming, how to do high leverage learning. So all about front loading. So the front loaded leverage model, front loaded business model, how to get a job faster, how to get your first client faster, how to network faster, how to network with bigger circles and more people and do it faster and better than everybody else, how to have a little bit of charisma even if you're an introvert. So all of these things are really important. How to get your first promotion, how to negotiate. And so I really want you guys to go sign up for that email list. That accelerator, I'm telling you, that is a really interesting thing that I've done. It's probably one of the most amazing pieces of work that I've personally done are recording these videos and doing the content for that accelerator that'll come out into that email course. So all you have to do is put in your email and you'll get every Monday a new assignment in the accelerator. It's a, a, both a lesson and then an exercise as well. And some weeks we're doing books where we're learning together. This is one of the most amazing and most passionate things that I've ever worked on. For some reason, I'm just super passionate about this like hyper accelerated career learning style. And, I'm, and I've done it so many times in my life, in my own career, doing things at so much more of a speed than everybody else around me, achieving so much more than I ever thought I could. And I'm simply breaking down the mentalities and the mental frameworks that I use to do that in this accelerator. So you guys are really gonna wanna check that out. And in that same vein, the next episode and the next series of episodes are super special and you guys are really gonna love those. So next, next week, we're gonna be talking to a guy named Josh Duty. So head on over to Twitter and give him a follow, at Josh Duty, D-O-O-D-Y. And he is a negotiation and career expert. He's gonna help teach us how we can get from a person that knows a little bit of web development all the way through setting up our resume, setting up our LinkedIn, going to our first web development interview, getting through the first technical interview, getting through the first character interview or in-person interview. Then we're gonna to touch on, and he's gonna help us learn how to negotiate our first, our first raise before we even get the job offer. So, the, so before we even sign the job offer, he's gonna help us understand how to leverage our skills and actually get us more money at the beginning. Then he's gonna help us learn how to go about doing promotions. Like when should I think about getting a promotion? What is an acceptable time frame to consider an appro a promotion or consider approaching my boss and requesting a promotion? So this is really an excellent series of episodes that we're doing next, and I know you guys are gonna love it. Josh is an amazing guy. So head on over to fearlesssalarynegotiation.com to get Josh's book. If you wanna read the book before we do the episodes, I would, I would recommend that. It's a great book, it's on Amazon, you can check it out, and uh, it's, got, it's packed with great information. I've read it and I, I really took a lot of takeaways, and guys, I took a ton of takeaways from the interview with him. The interview, it's gonna span a couple of different episodes starting next week on the Web Development Podcast. It's actually the first time we're ever doing a guest, as you might know. And we're really excited. I'm, I'm super excited to have him on and I'm super excited to let you guys listen to it. And this is a great time. And I hope you guys are going out there, getting after it, achieving your goals, doing what you gotta do to do the consistent necessary work that it takes to be successful, doing what you gotta do to learn, doing what you gotta do to put in the work, to program every night, to continue moving forward, and to never stop growing. Thanks guys, see you next week.